Hi, everyone, and thanks for being here. We've got lots of folks joining us today, so we're going to give them a few extra minutes, and then we'll get started. Hey everyone, and thanks for joining our Q3 interest rate webinar. For those that recognize my voice, my name is Sarah Conklin, co-host of the Rate Guide podcast, and as JP loves to say, the real boss here at Pensford. Before we get started, there's a few housekeeping notes. Um, presentation slides will be sent out after the webinar, so be on the lookout for that. And we'll do, be doing a Q&A afterwards, so if you have a question, put it in the chat, and JP will answer a few of those um, when the presentation is over. Um, and now without further ado, here's a man who loves to hate on his Philadelphia Eagles, J.P. Conklin. Thanks for that wonderful intro. I, um, for everybody who's on, I tried to pass the time by getting us to banter about best dad jokes, and she refused. Um, I had one teed up, so while people are still logging on, I'll ask you one, Sarah. Okay. Uh, when, when does a dad joke become a dad joke? I don't know when it becomes apparent. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> and with that, I figure we're setting the stage for the rest of this webinar. So we'll, just, we'll jump in with that backdrop. Sounds uh, great. Thanks for joining everybody. See if I can figure out um, 
my slides here. All right, so uh, Sarah likes to have me start off with a couple um, high points about the two companies that we run. Um, obviously, Pensford been around for going on 15 years, uh, second largest cap placer uh, in the market. Um, and I think we we try to value uh, our services as all the effort that goes in between the transactions, uh, not just the transactions themselves. A um, couple things to call out would be um, that we have done a ton of defeasances over the last couple of years. And every once in a while, someone will say, I didn't realize you, you guys did defeasances. And we do. Um, and then the other one is we do mark to markets for free. So if you're paying for mark to markets, feel free to give us a call and we will offer those to you for free. Um, on the loan boss side, I'll highlight that uh, every single person who's ever seen a demo or became a client uh, has said it's so much more than I expected. So if you're not really sure, just sign up for a quick demo with our sales team to walk you through it. Um, I suspect that you you will be pretty blown away by um, all the incorporation of live interest rates. Um, and as we like to say there at the bottom, we take care of the client, the rest takes care of itself. And that applies to everything that we do. Um, none of which could happen without the backing of a strong team. And my team has um, done some really nice things for me um, the last couple of months since we last spoke. Um, most notably, they decided to give me a toilet. Uh, and they told me I could stick my interest rate predictions in that toilet. That is a full toilet. Um, they put it, they mounted it on ply board. Uh, they then put wheels under the ply board so that they could roll it around the office um, and just keep reminding me where I should put my predictions. Uh, I also get some love from some fans. You know, it turns out I'm pretty popular. Um, so in the middle, you can see a voodoo doll um, that came with some pins, um, one jabbing me through the heart there. That came from one client who was uh, not stoked about how some of my interest rate predictions have gone. And then another one who uh, sent me just a you stink Amazon trophy, um, which I and I still proudly present both of those. Um, and then last but not least, Pence got cited by uh, the Penn State alternative index uh, for inflation. And I suspect after they watch today's webinar, they'll realize, oh, wait, that wasn't a credible source. We probably shouldn't be bragging about that. And don't be surprised if that uh, citation comes down. A uh, couple interesting things about interest rates that we've seen so far this year. Um, I won't go through all of these, but you'll notice that like um, DSCR is obviously down quite a bit on the floating stuff. Um, watch list for Freddie deals is up dramatically. Um, with IO ending in particular. And that list is just going to continue to grow. Like th th that 4.1 billion is stuff that's already in the pipeline. Um, and so I suspect that many of those will continue to deteriorate uh, in the next year or so. Um, spreads have come in. That's been some positive news. Strikes have gone up. That's helped with some cost. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner, just pointing out that look how dramatically the market for cap providers has shifted in the last couple of years. And one of the things I would really stress is if you're only getting one or two quotes, you should give us a call. Um, there's a lot more market participants lately. Um, Wells started the trend um, last year. We can get a lot more quotes, and it's important that you check because, as you can see in 2023, um, not the, the same banks are winning that used to win. Uh, and that's not a reflection on the banks who are no longer winning. It's that everybody else has gotten very aggressive. This is a market that they want to play in now that the premiums are no longer, you know, 10 grand. Uh, last but not least, you'll see down there at the strikes um, how over the last couple of years they've gravitated up from the low twos to the mid threes. Uh, before we get started, just a shout out to a bunch of the the um, people out there that put in a lot of time um, trying to put together economic commentary that we we particularly enjoy. Um, I would encourage you to go track all of these. They're all way better than we are. Um, so go follow these guys because they're outstanding in what they do. Um, the only shout out I'll specifically I'll give is to my gram in um, State College. Uh, I always know that if, if I run an idea past her and she's heard of it, that it means that uh, it has worked its way through mainstream media and now is on um, every mom and pop's uh, lips. First two things we'll talk about are probably the two most pressing questions we get. Number one, deficit and what impact that's gonna have on interest rates. I was very surprised to learn that the correlation is not that high. I don't think it's zero, but it, it's not that high. Um, so just the fact that we have deficits right now does not suggest we have to have inflation. Um, if other things are conspiring against it, inflation will come down. Uh, and then the other one is the election. Obviously, uh, a lot of chatter around the election. Um, I do think that it, it has an impact on the broader real estate market as a whole. Back in 2012, 
I was having lunch with one of our best clients and I was saying to him, like, our volume has just totally dried up. And like, what's going on? Is, is everybody worried about a Democrat winning um, the White House? And he said, no, don't let people tell you that. Um, they'll, they'll complain about that. But really, real estate professionals just need to know what rules to play by. And a presidential election is the biggest threat to those rules. It's like I suspect, regardless of who wins, when we get on the other side of this, the credit spigot will open back up and transactions will start happening because they'll know what rules to play by, even if they disagree with them. Um, he was right. That's exactly what happened. And we went on a tear for several years. Um, so as I look at it, I think, OK, the, the way that the White House will influence Powell next year is probably not as strong as it was a couple of years ago, because Powell's term now runs through 2026. So I don't think he will be as susceptible to pressure as he was a couple of years ago. Doesn't mean the White House won't try to exert pressure. And I think you see that in a lot of his statements. Every time he has a Q&A, he stresses how they understand inflation is impacting every American citizen. Um, I suspect he's feeling pressure. That pressure will continue to get ratcheted up. I think that pressure will change, that this past year has been about inflation, and next year will be about, hey, can we lower interest rates and make things, make things a little bit easier for everybody? Um, I don't think that he will be um, – he will have to re react to it the way that he did a couple years ago when he was up for renomination. Um, across the board, the market's bias is for higher interest rates right now. Whether it's SOFR or 10-year Treasury, it's a staggering amount of short positions. Now, this is not the same as buying and selling. This is more like I'm making a bet on rates going up or down. And so this is probably really a reflection of what is the probability that rates will go up. And I suspect that the, a lot of this piling on is because people are starting to wonder, was 2010 to 2021, 22, the anomaly? And should I be piling into a trade to take advantage of you know, new normal of 5% interest rates and higher, you know, 6 7% interest rates. Uh, without a doubt, upward pressure being applied to interest rates this way. I won't go through this entire grid, but I think the, the main takeaway is the Fed is pushing back any possibilities of cuts into at least middle of next year and likely the second half of next year. Now, the market is not really buying the narrative that they're going to hike again this year. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. But it is buying the fact that we will be higher for longer. Even if we don't start cutting, um, they're going to stay at a certain level for a while just to make sure that inflation battle is won. And if you look down at the bottom here, um, what the market is projecting for year-end treasuries, it's essentially saying, I have no clue. Like, we're just going to assume that it's not changing for the next three years and whatever. And we know we won't be right, but this is, this is what we're dealing with right now. This is the infamous Harry chart. Um, big takeaways here are, in general, the market underestimates the path of interest rates um, during a tightening cycle. We are now coming to the conclusion of that. And so the flip side is also true, which is, generally speaking, the market overestimates the path once we start cutting. And so this is why all the analysis we've ever done has said historically the worst time to fix is when fixed rates are below floating rates, right? Right before the Fed starts um, pausing because the bottom falls out. And if you lock now, you're going to miss out on the ride down, right? This time could certainly be different. Um, and so I understand everybody's angst around that. And I'm not suggesting that they ignore that. It's just every other time, this is the pattern that has occurred. So what to expect when you're expecting rate cuts. Section one, um, most important takeaway from yesterday's Fed meeting is that they can't stop talking up hikes because the minute they do, people are going to start talking about cuts, right? And so they can't let off the brakes yet. Um, I think the second big takeaway is fewer cuts rather than more hikes. Remember I said market hasn't really changed its pricing around the November hike. November 1 is around a 30%. That just tells me it's going to wait until we see the data and get some more Fed speak about before it starts pricing it in more aggressively. Um, as a reminder, once those Fed hike probabilities exceed 60%, if the Fed disagrees with the market odds, they will start to send signals. They will come out and they will say, <clears throat> we're pretty confident we're going to be hiking. Right. So that if those odds are at 30 percent and the Fed's like, we're probably hiking. You will hear about it ahead of time. They go dark a week before the Fed meeting. So really about two weeks before the meeting. So you're talking sort of mid-October is the last chance. If they disagree with market sentiment in mid-October, they will be sending a lot of signals. If they agree with it, then the market's interpretation is correct. <clears throat> by, <clears throat> excuse me. By the time we get to the Fed meeting itself, 
there is no doubt. There was no doubt going into yesterday's meeting that they were not hiking. Odds were at 98, 99%. That's a done deal, right? So if if you're ever not sure, go to CME, Fed Watch, and just check out the market odds. Those things are pretty dialed in. Other big takeaways are, number one, there's no forecast of a recession. So we are now in Goldilocks territory. I think one CNBC commentator said, Goldilocks forever. This is amazing. They're basically saying that things are going to be perfect um, in perpetuity. Uh, the other one is sufficiently restrictive for a long enough time. So that's pretty ambiguous. But what he's saying is we're going to keep rates high enough for long enough to make sure that we are cooling off the economy. Lots of wiggle room there, but also sending a signal that, hey, we're not going to start cutting at the first sign of winning the war on inflation. We really need to make sure that we beat this down. Um, a couple other things, two fewer cuts in next year and two fewer in the year after, a full point fewer cuts over the next couple of years. Uh, my interpretation is the hurdle to cuts next year will be pretty high, at least initially. That can change if the, mark, uh, if the economy keeps deteriorating. Um, and then the other big one was the long-term Fed funds rate came in the uh, summary of economic projections came out at 2.9%, so basically 3%. Um, that's up quite a bit from what is normally two and a half percent. That's always been their go-to. And that drives me to this quote here where it's a, it may be that the neutral rate has risen and it's certainly plausible that the neutral rate is higher than the longer run rate. So essentially the Fed's saying maybe we have reached new normal and sort of two to two and a half has, is now becoming three uh, percent in terms of where we expect to land long term. By the Fed's own measures, we are in restrictive territory. We just don't know if this is sufficiently restrictive. I don't think that they know. I think they want to see how all this data plays out over the next six to nine months. Um, but I will highlight the risk, which is it has actually gotten less restrictive over the last couple months. And this is another reason why Powell cannot stop talking tough about hikes, because the minute he does, this will become more accommodative and, and basically offset all the work that he's trying to put in on this front. Uh, San Francisco Fed has its own proxy Fed funds rate, and this tries to reflect things such as forward guidance, quantitative tightening, um, any of those sort of things that would, would contribute to expectations. And so from their perspective, real Fed funds, quote unquote, is really about 2% higher than the one that we all are familiar with, you know, 540-ish, um, which just means things are tightening pretty quickly. We just haven't really felt the effect. We only got to real interest rates, positive real interest rates on the floating side earlier this year. So we haven't been dealing with dramatically high positive interest rates for very long. Um, this stuff is just starting to work its way through the system. We'll talk about how I believe that impacts the um, soft landing theory. When it comes to rate cuts, keep in mind, they never see them coming, ever. Ever see uh, rate cuts coming? Um, you can see up there, we went back and we got some quotes from 2019. Their Philly Fed president on July 19th said uh, no rate changes this year. Twelve days later, they were cutting, right? And so we went back and looked at December 15 to December 18 was the last tightening cycle. They had raised Fed funds from 25 basis points to two and a half during that time, right? Slow and steady, just like we used to do it all the time, the good old days. Um, December 2018. Their SEP said, we think we're going to hike two more times in 2019, okay? Putting Fed funds around 3%, right? I'm going to skip to here because we're going to end up here, but notice how where we ultimately ended up. This is pre-COVID. This is not impacted by COVID one bit, 1%. They were, they were too high by 2%, right? And this is coming at a time where they thought they were still hiking. So they hadn't even gotten to a point where they thought they were pausing. Now, fast forward to the March 19 meeting, and they're like, you know what? We are done. This is the pause, right? But we're not cutting. We're definitely not cutting. We're just going to level off here. Fast forward a couple more months. Guess what? Now they're pricing in cuts, right? Two cuts at that meeting. Fast forward another couple months. They did it again, right? They, now they can't even keep up. They can't even keep up with the number of cuts that they're actually doing. And so at every single Fed meeting in 2019, the summary of economic projections the things that we're all referencing from yesterday's meeting as implying that the Fed is going to hike on November 1 were wrong, right? And it's why we shouldn't read too much into it for next year either, because the economy could potentially change pretty dramatically and upset the apple cart dramatically. So while it's a good guidepost, I would also say it doesn't take much for it to be wrong, particularly at an inflection point. I think if we were 
going back um, six months and we knew that there was no chance that they were going to stop hiking, um, then it might have a little bit more weight. We're at the, we're at the pivot point. So I think there's a much greater chance that they don't know what's coming next from here on out. Interestingly enough, faster hikes don't necessarily mean faster cuts, right? That was my intuition was, well, I bet we just come down that much faster. Um, really, there's no correlation. So uh, the Fed might be right that we might only cut 50 basis points next year. Um, don't just assume that we, since we went up over 5%, we've got to come down 5% in, in rapid order as well. I will highlight this bottom graph, which is the, we started including, I think, for like 18 months ago. It basically just said, you know, on the day of the last hike, what did the forward curve say? And that's those dotted lines. And then what ultimately happened, right? And the, the theme over and over and over again was the forward curve said flat rates. Rates are not dropping, right? And maybe even up a little bit, but basically nothing. We're basically done for the next three years. The solid lines are what actually ended up happening. And as you can see, within about a year, the bottom starts to fall out. You get out to two or three years, and the bottom has definitely fallen out. The one notable exception is 94, which is probably the only soft landing the Fed has ever achieved. That's because they backed out 75 basis points pretty quickly and basically gave us some more room to run with there. Aside from that, they over tighten. We end up having to slash and burn rates. I think the fact that the market has backed out cuts means – the forward curve is mu that much flatter. It's that much more similar to previous pauses. And it's like maybe we're repeating the exact same pattern again. Maybe we were overdoing the cuts. We've backed them out, and now the cuts will come two years from now. The R squared, the neutral rate, this is the rate at which neither encourages or discourages growth, right? There's a lot of chatter around, hey, how has this number changed? And one of the questions we get a lot is, um, is 5% sort of the new normal, right? And I would say probably not. Right. Who knows? But probably not. Um, it's probably higher than it was from 2010 to 2020. It is a moving target, which is part of the reason it's so challenging. Um, but across various measures, the average is around one and a half percent. And you would add the Fed's target inflation rate to that two percent to kind of land at um, what is the, the ultimate landing spot of Fed funds. Right. So it puts you in the neighborhood of three and a half percent. Right. Um, so I think that we will see rates come back down. I don't expect to see them come back down to zero, barring a shock of some kind. Um, but you'll also note there's quite a bit of variance in these. So no one really knows. Pal has said they don't really know. Um, it, they're just guessing. It's probably somewhere in that 3% range, whereas from 2010 to 2020, it's probably more like in the 2% range. Maybe we've shifted up by about a point. Um, real Fed funds, and you're going to keep hearing this going forward, which is real rates, which are rates adjusted for inflation. And when we adjust for inflation and we end up with a positive number, that means that the Fed funds is higher than inflation, right? Or the 10-year Treasury is higher than inflation. That's restrictive, right? And that's what the Fed wants. So really, regardless of how we measure this, we have transitioned into positive territory, and the market expects we will remain in positive territory, this is exactly what Powell wants. He wants restrictive conditions. He wants to cool things down. He wants there to be a cost to do business. Um, and that's what we're seeing. All of this is paying off so far for Powell. Um, you'll see we've only been positive from a Fed fund standpoint since March. So really not that long, six-ish months, right? In previous cycles, the average is about five years. Um, the last two cycles, if you, if you just focus on those, it's a little over two years. So either way, we probably have a while to go where Fed funds is above inflation, right? And from Powell's perspective, that just means he's really applying the brakes to the economy and really ensuring that he's driving inflation down. That's probably why we won't see a slash and burn rate cycle barring a shock or the bottom totally falling out of inflation. Um, again, we've, we rolled this out probably 18 months ago. Pause to cut, same thing, right? It's never exceeded. 15 months. So there, whatever we pause, there will be a backside to this curve, but we just keep pushing it out. <laughs> we keep thinking we're almost there. We're almost there. We can start the clock and then we can't. Um, yesterday's meeting just reinforced that. They're just pushing that out as much as possible because they don't want people talking about cuts yet because that will ease financial conditions and be counterproductive to what they're trying to do. Unfortunately, what does this mean? Cap prices keep going up. And so this, this graph here, you can see cap prices just keep going up. And part of the reason they keep going up is because they just any strike basically becomes more and more in the money or closer to being in the money. 
And so it's just more expensive. It's essentially prepaid interest, right? But the Fed's not helping the cause at all because they keep the door open to future hikes, meaning volatility is up. Imagine if you're a trader. How do you price a cap in this environment right now? They're like, I mean, I thought we were going to be done at five, and here we are at five and a half, and we're still talking about maybe 575. There was one um, Fed official who puts Fed funds north of six this year, right, in a little blue dot. So if you're a trader, you're just saying, listen, I don't, I don't know how to price this for you, so I'm going to charge you an arm and a leg just to be sure because I don't want to get pinched on, on the other side of this. I use the three-year treasury as a, as a decent proxy for the direction of cap prices. And as you can see, we are back to basically 20-year levels. Um, there's not a lot standing between 5% and 7% if we break through 5% and, and persist through 5%. Um, so keep that in mind that I don't think that's what's going to happen. But if for some reason the Fed does have to keep hiking, there, there is a non-zero probability that the three-year treasury could run up to 7% in pretty short order. Now, whenever we get to the backside, we've also been sending this graph out for 18 months, and we just keep thinking we're almost there, we're almost there, and we're not almost there. But when we get to the backside of this, the bottom will fall out on cap prices. Um, this is why Powell refuses to acknowledge any potential for rate cuts right now. It's because this sort of message is everything is going to get better in the next three to six months, and he doesn't want that message yet. Um, what we're seeing in the market right now is, hey, buy your loan floor out while you still can, okay? Um, if you believe that rates are going to fall dramatically and you have a floor, it's a good opportunity to say, you know what? The market doesn't think rates are going to fall, but I do. This floor might be pretty cheap. It's very easy for us to price. We price them the exact same way that we price caps. They're just going the opposite direction, right? In the example in the bottom right-hand corner, a $50 million three-year floor at 4%. It costs about 700 grand, right? So it's it's material upfront fee, but you only need SOFR to average 353 over those three years to pay for itself. So you can get that money back pretty quickly. And if the bottom does fall out, you'll be glad that you have it. The other thing that we have a lot of clients do is take that information and go and try to negotiate the floor out just by paying the uh, the lender an origination fee, right? So if I price that and say, hey, I know it's worth 700 grand, maybe I go back to the lender and I say, hey, listen, um, if we give you 200 grand, will you get rid of this floor? Right. And I'm essentially paying the, the lender directly for it. And most lenders are willing to at least have that discussion. Um, they, they will, of course, call us and ask us what the market is. But then you guys can have a negotiation uh, around a relationship discussion rather than uh, market value. The other thing we're seeing a lot of is forward starting hedges, which is let's shift out the start date. Normally, there's a forward premium. It costs more, whether you're buying a cap or doing a swap, it costs more to do something in the future. That's not the case because of the downward sloping forward curve. So this is really important for uh, replacement caps. If you have replacement caps next year that you have to buy, it might be cheaper to buy it, especially if you're nervous about where cap costs are going to go or that the Fed might keep hiking, right? Um, the other huge one is construction loans. Uh, you're drawing equity for 18 months. You got to buy a cap at some point. That forward curve is pretty low 18 months out. Plus, you probably have a draw schedule. So if, if you have a three-year draw schedule, your, your biggest chunk of hedges um, is five years out. That's much lower. So don't be surprised if those, those hedging costs are much lower than you expect. Uh, as you can see in that example down below, we ran a scenario, just a simple two-year cap. Um, if I bought it today, it'd be 820 grand. Um, if I started a year from now, it's 600 grand, right? So just give us a shout if you want to look through that. This is a vol service. This is us just kind of geeking out, so I won't spend a ton of time on this. You might not care the way that we do, but this is how um, cap prices are influenced, right? So on the left is a more typical vol surface. Um, you start in the, in the quadrant in the bottom uh, pointed towards us, and that is essentially then starts moving up and out, right, as you move out tenor. So let's sort of go along the right-hand side. Is Cap's basically free the shorter it is, right? But as I start moving up and out, it starts getting more and more expensive, right? So that's a tip that makes sense. If I'm buying a 30-year cap, which we've never sold, I think our, our longest ones are 10 years generally, um, but you could, it gets pretty expensive, right? There's a lot of uncertainty going out that direction. But look how the shape of the curve is today. This is what a vault service looks like today, which is essentially spikes day one because that's where all the cost is and actually rolls over and gets less expenses as you, as you roll out. So there are ways to take advantage of that, but just keep in mind that we're in this weird time where one-year caps are almost as expensive as two-year caps. 
you can use that vol to your advantage by selling and buying vol simultaneously. And I won't get into all the mechanics here, but this is a corridor, which some of you are familiar with. Um, but by buying and selling caps back and forth, you basically satisfy most requirements, but a cap corridor will. And what I'll point out to you here is there, there are some areas that we've worked on where a capped corridor provides the exact same protection as a plain vanilla cap and it costs less. It doesn't make any sense, but it's because the volatilities are washing each other out. So if you have a scenario you want us to look at, just let us know and we'll just tell you this is plain vanilla cap makes more sense in this example or hey, a capped corridor is actually going to save you a couple hundred grand in this scenario. So let's switch gears to fixed rates. It's been an interesting day so far for fixed rates. Um, 435 was the key technical level. Next really main key technical level is like five and a quarter, right? So there again is a non-zero chance that rates are gonna spike from here. Um, we'll probably encounter some psychological resistance of four and a half, but if we keep seeing upward pressure on 10 years treasury, there's no guarantee it's gonna stop there. Um, Powell pointed out yesterday, and I agree with him, that 10 year yields are, are rising because of real yields uh, and term premium returning to the market, not higher inflation expectations, right? That was the driver over the last 12 months, that's no longer the driver. Now it's more about, we actually think that the economy is doing okay, and therefore 10-year treasury should be higher. Uh, Bloomberg, immediately after the Fed meeting, surveyed people. As you can see, the bias is higher rates. Whether it's the 10-year treasury or the two-year treasury, higher rates is, is largely the sentiment. Um, and so 48% think 10 years going above 4.5%. Uh, that brings up convexity buying and selling, right? And so You'll see in our newsletters, I'll frequently say, hey, listen, if we break 392, we could be off to the races. If we break four and a quarter, we could be off to the races. It also works coming the other direction. We can't look, we can't uh, wait for those days. Uh, but what's really driving those levels is convexity hedging, right? And so in this environment, we're seeing convexity selling. And so I found a graph. This is from 2021. You can tell because the 10-year treasury is 140, which sounds adorable now looking back on it. But this convexity related selling line right here basically said, you know, 140-ish, maybe 142 is probably the level. And it's really nothing more that once rates get above that, you have to rebalance your portfolio. And everybody rebalances their portfolio at the same level because they're all using the same algorithms. And it triggers a massive selling effect. And then, boom, you're off to the races, right? You go from 140 to 180 in a couple days or in a week. That's what we're seeing right now. Every time we breach one of these levels, everybody starts rebalancing. They sort of throw in the towel, they sell, and it causes another spike, right? And so we're wrapped up in that right now. We're, we went from 392 now to almost 4.5% in pretty short order. Um, it will work in reverse when we get to that point. But for right now, I'm far more concerned that we see it continue to spike given the sentiment around uh, rising interest rates. Quantitative tightening um, is also having some impact, although it's a, it's a marginal impact. Um, that's been on autopilot for over a year, so I don't know that that's really driving it. But the Fed is, continues to try to shrink its balance sheet. Bloomberg came out this week and said, and we think that they're probably going to have to wrap that up next summer. Um, after they pause, the next logical step of ending a tightening cycle is um, stopping quantitative tightening. So there will probably come a time next summer where they have to um, stop. Maybe the balance sheet's down to seven trillion, um, and they will say, "Hey, listen, we at least got two trillion rolled off." Um, the other interesting thing is that as those holdings shrink, it naturally means foreign investors have a greater percentage, right? And we become subject to the whims of foreign holders. Um, on the deficit side, we saw a lot of news recently about how we've exceeded 33 trillion. That is important. This is not a non-event, but I would also say, hey, listen, we got to keep in perspective, measured as a percentage of GDP, right? Um, Wells had a great piece this week that said, hey, we're around 67% of GDP. It's not good. Uh, it's probably twice the average, um, but it's also not catastrophic uh, when you look on a relative basis. Um, they also had an interesting uh, stat that said the government spent 1.8% of GDP on interest in 2019, 2.3% of GDP on interest in the last 12 months, right? And that number will keep climbing because just like people who have uh, commercial real estate loans that are maturing and they have to replace it with now current interest rates, it's going to be much higher. That average will continue to climb. Um, it's still at manageable levels, but it is something to keep an eye on. 
for our purposes, what we care about is, generally speaking, a 1% increase in the deficit translates into about 15 to 30 basis points of upward pressure on treasury yields. So it does have an impact on the interest rates that we see in the market. And then the last thing I'll talk about um, with upward technical pressure is the currency manipulation. And this slide basically encapsulates everything I know about currency. So if there's any follow-up questions, I probably won't be able to answer them, but it essentially boils down to this. Uh, generally speaking, a country like Japan that would rather be an exporter prefers a weak currency, right? But right now, a weak currency means things that they import, most notably food and energy, are more expensive because their currency is weak relative to whatever they're importing. So what do they do? They prop up their currency. They have to buy their own currency, just like the way that we propped up our bond market, uh, and they buy their own currency, and they keep the value rising to keep up with rising dollar strength as U.S. interest rates rise. But the way that they accomplish that is by, by getting the proceeds from selling treasuries. So they'll sell U.S. treasuries, which puts upward pressure on our yields. They take that money, and then they buy their own currency, right? And so they do that, and that manipulates our 10-year treasury yield as well. And then it also kind of creates this vicious cycle because as our rates rise, we just look that much stronger, and then they have that much more to keep up with, and it creates this vicious cycle. Um, gun lack sanity check. This thing has held true for a really long time. It's kind of mind blo uh, mind blowing. Um, obviously, COVID distorted it. And I was like, you know, let's just see how it's doing now. I hadn't checked it in a while. It comes out and it says 440 on the tenure treasury. It's where the tenure treasury should be. Uh, another stark reminder why some people are billionaires and I'm not. Uh, so let's talk about inflation. Powell made a comment probably two months ago. He, he said that um, we're navigating by the stars under cloudy skies. Right. And my response was, well, why are we navigating by the stars when we have GPS? Right. Here are the stars. Headline CPI, headline PCE, some of those headline things, it feels like we're still pretty far off. Um, but I'm like, well, yeah, but we're, we have more um, specific data than that now. Why aren't we referencing that? And his argument would be this top graph. And these are probably the two most important graphs in this entire presentation. Right. And that is, if you lay the, the path that we're on, over the 1970s and then also over post-World War II, it's kind of eerie, right? And it lays out two potential outcomes. And the first one is one that Powell and, and pretty much everybody is mostly focused on. And that is, we want to avoid the late 70s, early 80s, right? We have successfully summited and descended McKinley and K2, right? But Everest is lurking. And Powell is saying, I am not going to Pass that off to one of my successors, right? I'm going to see this through to the end. I'm going to do Volcker before we even get to that point, before we even need Volcker, right? The other one is, are we sure? Or is this really this sort of post-COVID explosion similar more to the end of World War II explosion where we saw that surge? And really, the trend is just going to keep going down lower. So we don't know. I'm in the camp of the bottom graph, but I know a lot of people on this call are in the camp of the higher graph. And I can see why the Fed would err on the side of caution and say, you know what, we're just going to make sure that there's no Everest lurking out there. Um, the shelter component that everybody is very familiar with at this point is about to fall off a cliff. And I keep stressing the newsletter, this is not a projection. This is just math catching up. This is happening. So Expect the shelter component to start dragging down inflation. If you look at more uh, sophisticated measures, more current measures, they've already fallen pretty dramatically. The one I keep putting in the newsletter is the Penn State one. Um, it showed that it, it started falling um, a while ago and actually started rebounding a couple months ago. So we've already seen the bottom. We just haven't seen it yet in the government's official statistics. Things like super core inflation and underlying inflation gauges also showing really positive news. We're around 2% on both of those. The Fed is doing a great job on inflation. I think that they could do a better job with messaging, but there's no doubt that the outcome is pretty good when you consider CPI was over 9% uh, just over a year ago. Trueflation has this measure. We've been bouncing around 2%, 2.5% for several months now. Um, and again, going back to a Penn State modified index, uh, we're at 2% for core PCE. Uh, we're just waiting for the government's core PCE version to catch up. Uh, interesting to note, the surge in oil, you know, I think we're up quite a bit in the last sort of 90 days. We went from 70 to 90 bucks a barrel in north, um, has pulled up inflation expectations a little bit. So that's these right here. Um, 
but not a ton. So I think the market is looking past that and saying, you know what, um, the winning the inflation war wasn't dependent on um, 70 bucks a barrel to begin with. So this doesn't change that completely. There are knock-on effects. It will have an impact, especially the longer this goes, or if we were to run up to you know 120 bucks a barrel. But it's not enough yet for us to lose sleep over. And if you think back to sort of the oil shocks of the 70s and 80s, the thing to keep in mind is oil quadrupled in 12 months. So we would need to see oil well north of 200 bucks to sort of mimic what we saw back in the 70s. We're not anywhere close to that. So is it up? Yes. It, will it have an impact? Yes. Um, the market's not losing sleep over it yet. Um, and the other thing is we're way ahead of schedule on inflation right now. And that's because the Fed hiked so aggressively. Um, in general, you need about two and a half years from the first hike before inflation moves towards 2% and keeps moving, right? I think what Powell's trying to figure out right now is, are we going to keep moving towards 2 or, or are we going to see a reacceleration? And because of that, I'm not willing to let off the brakes yet. Uh, but you don't have to just take our word for it. Um, the Fed's got a whole bunch of measures. I listed the, um, the Fed in that page where we gave a shout out. And I'll just stress to you guys, like every Fed economist I've ever spoken to, I've been blown away by. Um, they are shockingly good at their jobs and shockingly entertaining as well. Way, way more entertaining than I am. But they have their own measures. And here's like a Fed rent index measure. It's fallen off a cliff. Pal knows this, right? He's just waiting for that official number to catch up. Uh, they, have a, they have a trimmed mean number. We're down around 3%, right? Now he's going to keep an eye as it reaccelerating, but we're winning the war right? The Fed's got an inflation now cast. And so the one that, that matters the most generally to an economist would be the last three months annualized. And that's here, 3.01 core PCE, not the 4.1 that the government statistic is reporting. It, if you take the last three months and annualize that, we're at 3.01. Pretty good. Not ready to declare a victory, but this is, this is progressing quite well. On the labor front, you guys know I'm pretty skeptical of uh, the strength of the labor market. It's not that I think it's weak, it's that I don't think it's as strong as everybody thinks it is. Um, and I was at a uh, Richmond Fed presentation, the Charlotte branch, and they had this great slide about the beverage curve. And so we have talked about that in the past. I haven't brought it up in a while, but I'm gonna start with this graph first. And that is, this is what a typical beverage curve looks like. And this is job openings, and this is the unemployment rate. So Y-axis job openings, X-axis unemployment rate. The fewer job openings you have, the more unemployment you have, which makes sense, right? If there's a ton of job openings, then unemployment should be pretty low and vice versa, right? What we saw with COVID was it totally broke down. And this is actually April 2020, right? And then it just starts working its way back across. And it starts getting super wonky until you get to the first hike, right? Then it, all of a sudden it goes vertical and it just falls off a cliff and goes straight down. And so what this means is job openings are plunging. These jobs are getting full and full, but we're not shifting to the right like we normally do. If you look on, on the typical beverage curve, a 2% drop should push you out at least 2% and maybe even more on the unemployment rate, right? So if you're at three and a half, you should be at five and a half ish. I think this is exhibit A for why Powell and company believe that the labor market is exhibiting strength right now. These job openings are being filled and we're not seeing unemployment shift, right? So from in their, stand, in their defense, I get that. That makes sense to me. I have a different stance, which is no matter what, every single month, like clockwork, we end up revising the prior month's number and nobody seems to care. And then we pretend like the number we just got is the source of truth and it's fantastic and the labor market is super resilient. And you, you print the retraction on page six in tiny font and nobody seems to mention it. Um, and yet we've done it every single month, right? Look at June. We revised June down by 104,000. If we went back and that number, that headline number on the day to come out on, I think it was July 7th, the June numbers had been 105,000. Would we all have been arguing how resilient the job market is, right? So we've revised that down just over the course of this year by 355,000. We revised last year's numbers down by over 300,000. And we make two gigantic seasonal and business adjustments to these numbers. The seasonal adjustment basically says, we're gonna to try to adjust based on seasonality that we're familiar with, and we think that this results in a more accurate number. So the motors are totally fine, but just keep in mind, if we, did, if we weren't making seasonal adjustments, we would have averaged 80,000 jobs per month over the course of the entire year, 
not anywhere close to the 200 plus that we have been averaging. So keep, just keep that in mind. The second one, this is the one that kind of kills me, is this birth death adjustment, which has nothing to do with humans. But it's about businesses. And they basically just say, we think this many businesses have been created. This many businesses have died. And this is how many jobs that have been created out of the net increase of businesses, right? Over a million have been assumed to have been created over the course of this year. It's entirely an estimate. And so if you were to back those out, we would actually have lost jobs this year, right? Now, I don't think that's actually happened, but I do think that it's something less than the most resilient job market in the history of the universe when you account for all these revisions and these, these estimates. Private quits are down dramatically. That's a signal that the job market is is rolling over this this damn jolts thing has been driving me nuts for about a year now i'd never heard of it in 20 years and all of a sudden we're we're making monetary policy decisions based off of it um it's down three million jobs since the start of the year but also keep in mind the response rate is just 30 percent this there's no statistician in the universe that would accept this right now um a couple years ago it was 50 percent businesses aren't responding anymore so can we really trust this stuff uh going back to the feds measures right k uh kansas city fed has a a momentum index not looking good. It has it has plunged since early 2021. Um, and then we've also got this labor market activity index, which says, hey, listen, unemployment is probably about to start climbing because this the labor market activity is inversely related and it's starting to drop. So we're probably going to see unemployment climb. And it's really not as strong as we are suggesting because we are not keeping pace with the trend that we were seeing prior to COVID in the first place, right? So job market was growing relatively robustly heading into that, even though 2019 was kind of a weak year and the Fed was starting to cut rates. Um, but also keep in mind, the participation rate is keeping unemployment artificially low. That if we use 2019's participation rate, the unemployment rate today would be around 4.5%. That's still a very good unemployment rate. I'm not arguing that the, that the economy is terrible. It's that it's not quite as strong as people are saying it is, and maybe it's not quite as tight as people think it is. Um, Last but not least on this front is Challenger has this public job announcement, um, job cuts. Here's what we've announced year to date, right? 217% increase, okay? This is year to date. It is higher than any actual totals for any prior year going back the last seven years. So we will definitely finish this year with more public job layoffs than in any year since they started doing this seven years ago. And that brings us to the SOM rule which is a pretty highly regarded rule um, that an economist, Claudia Sam came up with, which essentially says the three-month average unemployment rate goes up by half a point over the last year's bottom, a recession ensues. So it's pretty simple, right? That graph illustrates that point. And you can see we're not quite at the trigger, but we're moving up in that direction, right? Um, Bloomberg's got this amazing chief U economist named Anna Wong, and she puts the odds of this being triggered by year end at 40% and that the trigger point is 3.9%, right? And so even though we're not there yet, just keep in mind, we tend to hit it and then go through it quickly. So things could change very dramatically. And then in that same research piece that um, Dr. Wong had, it was really interesting to, for her to point out and say, hey, listen, year end confidence intervals for unemployment rate is 3.4% to 4.6%, right? 68%, so sort of one standard deviation, 3.6 to 4.2, right? Unemployment's going up one way or another. And if you stretch it out two years to the end of next year, you know, 15, 16 months, the high side is 9.9%. There's an asymmetric risk here, right? And so from her perspective, she thinks unemployment's going to climb pretty dramatically and be north of five at some point next year. And her reasoning is most economic models use this sort of mean forecasting tool and they are underestimating this right side of the graph all of this right side of the graph is essentially being wiped out from this mean modeling forecasting and so they're overlooking it and her point is they're underestimating the probability that we're going to have some some issues and so that leads us to you know well everything's fine because the fed keeps telling us and i'm like well are you sure because leading indicators are at levels that are have always resulted in a recession uh, and they tend to, to lead things such as GDP and unemployment by, you know, sort of three to eight-ish months. So it's not surprising to me that the bottom hasn't fallen out yet in the headline data. Um, PALS, preferred measure of a yield curve inversion, also deeply inverted um, and has been for some time. That's always a signal of a recession. 
Household net worths are down, and it's the, the worst it's been since the financial crisis. Excess savings, we've blown through them. We went negative in May of this year. And I don't think it's a, it's a total coincidence that credit card debt started surging at that point. I think everybody got really comfortable spending their money that the government handed out to them. And then once they ran out of it, they hadn't yet changed their spending habits, in part probably because they felt like the labor market was very strong. So now you see credit card debt is exceeding $1 trillion, all-time high. At the exact same moment, they've blown through all their excess savings. Can't be a coincidence, right? And then when you look at how the um, interest rates are going to start to impact all those uh, debt payments, like credit card payments, it's making up a much bigger percentage of disposable personal income than people are used to. They're not prepared for this. And oh, by the way, speaking of not prepared, you now have a student loan payment that we pretended didn't exist for the last three years, and we tried to, to wave a magic wand and make it disappear. Economists seem to not think this is going to be a big deal. Maybe not. Maybe I'm missing something here. But I don't know. Three to four hundred bucks a month seems to matter to a lot of people. And maybe the bigger effect is really a psychological one. That that three or four hundred bucks is coming at the same time that the labor market is weakening, and it'll just have a bigger impact on consumer spending than the headlines would suggest that three hundred dollars a month should. And then this is the one that's also driving me crazy, which is this um, this term lending program that that we opened up. Uh, when SVB happened. And everyone said, oh, well, look at the discount window. Like nobody's borrowing from the discount window, which is traditionally a sign of an emergency. It's like, well, yeah, that's because they just shifted their money over to this term loan pro program um, that closes next March if, you know, if the Fed doesn't extend it. And so right now, these these banks have basically posted their treasuries to the Fed. The Fed is giving them face value. So they're not asking them to mark to market. They're saying if that bond was is worth a hundred bucks, we're not discounting it to sixty bucks because rates are up. We're going to give you a hundred bucks in cash, right? So these banks are flush with cash. And so I was working at Wachovia during the financial crisis, from the first warning shot across the bow with the Bear Stearns hedge fund going under, to us going under, it was like sixteen months. So I don't know that the banking system's at risk, but I know it's been too soon to be able to give the all clear signal, especially when you throw a hundred billion dollars at it. Pensford would have a lot fewer problems, too, if you threw $100 billion at it, if the government's interested in trying that. This, this climb is concerning to me. If everything is fine, why does this balance keep going up? And my suspicion is it's because Treasury yields keep going up. So as those bond holdings keep becoming worth less and less, the Treasury at the banks is saying, you know what? This thing is worth 50 cents on the dollar. Let me give it to the Fed, and I'll get $100, $100 back, right? They're posting it, and the Fed is allowing it. We won't know who borrowed from this for two years, or at least a year after the maturity, so we probably have 18 months to go. I'm not convinced the banking system is as safe as the Fed is telling us it is. I think $100 billion is potentially covering up some weakness. So that leads us to the end, which is to heck with your soft landing. Um, so a lot of you know that I'm a pilot. Um, if I've ever met you in person, I probably flew myself there. Um, a soft landing isn't as much about the touchdown as it is about the approach. Right. And so I'm going to give you guys a little lesson in flight characteristics. So this is an airplane coming in for a landing. This is a nice, stable glide path coming in for a nice, stable landing, probably going to result in a soft landing. Right. There are various gates based on distance and altitude. So by the time you're three miles out, you should be a thousand feet AGL. Right. And you cross through that gate. This stabilized approach is predicated on things like your flight path, your power settings, your descent rate your configuration, uh, you're not, uh, no excessive maneuvers, you're not swerving to try to hit these gates. Uh, it's just nice, stable descent. And I think that the talk of a soft landing has increased because it feels like we're on this nice, stabilized approach coming in. Over here, you can see these are called pappy lights. And you want to see two white and two red, which is what you see here. This is a nice, stable approach coming in for a landing. This is probably going to result in a soft landing. So you look at what are the things that are contributing to that feeling. It's like cooling inflation, cooling labor market. Everything is coming down in a nice, predictable, linear, constant rate. Everything feels really smooth right now. So I went back and found two pictures from my own flights. One is Lock Haven, PA, where I go uh, to visit my grandmother or to go to see Penn State game or both. Um, Park City, Utah. The reason I highlighted both of these is both of these are really challenging airports to land at because they're nestled in valleys surrounded by mountains. So it's really challenging to get in there. But if you have a nice stabilized approach, soft landing. Um, Lock Haven in particular, I've had some pretty not soft landings. Without a doubt, the hardest landing I've ever had is Sedona. 
and Sarah can probably <laughs> uh, vouch for this. But what I have found is every rough landing is starts prior to the touchdown. It starts a few miles out, a few thousand feet up in the air. Something unexpected happens, whether it's like a, an unexpected wind shear or birds or other traffic, whatever it is, something happens. And even after that unexpected event occurs, the brain wants to continue with the landing, even though the approach is no longer stabilized. Once you're locked in, it's tough to say, I need to, I need to go around. And that's even more true when you're in the clouds, right? IMC. And so the go around, once you're no longer stabilized, is a necessity. And it's probably the hardest thing for a pilot to do. When I was in Sedona, we landed hard because we had gotten distracted. I would gotten distracted coming in, landed hard, porpoised twice, and went full power. Went up, took off, came around, landed smoothly. Everything was fine, right? But it was really hard to give up on that. Uh, and probably the only reason I did give up on it was because just a month prior during my annual training, I had done the exact same thing in a scenario with my trainer. And I porpoised twice. He took control of the plane, did full power, and we took off. And so when we landed in Sedona and did that, it was the exact same thing. And I instantly knew, go full power. I don't know that the Fed has the benefit of prior training from recent experiences on how to know when it's time to do a go around. And if Pal's comment that we are navigating by the stars under cloudy skies is true, then it means it's going to be even harder to hit the go around button because you're not going to want to launch yourself back up into the clouds and get disoriented. And so we always think we're going to have a soft landing, whether you're a pilot or an economist, everybody talks about a soft landing and along again, crushed it this week. Soft landing calls have preceded every recession. It always happens like this. This is not unique. Just like I complain about the labor market and that people shouldn't be looking at job losses or lack of job losses. We always are gaining 200,000 jobs going into a Fed pause. That's how it always happens, right? Same thing here. Soft calls always precede the past recessions. She's had this amazing quote in her research piece. I'm only going to highlight the, the italicized, which is, that's because recessions are nonlinear events, and the human mind is not wired for thinking nonlinearly, right? And that just like sort of blew me away because I'm like, that's so true. We all feel like we're on the stabilized approach. We are not prepared for something to knock us off, even though – very frequently, something does come along and knock us off. And so I thought of, you know, there's probably going to be several nonlinear events on the horizon this year. Um, the goat of nonlinear events is probably Mike McCarthy, and I'm just grateful that he coaches the Cowboys. Uh, and I hope several other of these are nonlinear events. An argument could be made, um, Bill, if you're listening, this is for you, um, that Lamar Jackson getting injured, it actually is expected, that we should just be prepared for that to happen. Um, but I see at least two soft landings on the horizon. Number one, Penn State will avoid nonlinear events against Ohio State, Michigan, and then Indiana, who somehow tends to ruin our party. We're heading to the whiteout on Saturday. Hopefully we have a soft landing at State College Airport when we fly ourselves up there. Um, if you've never been, it's a bucket list item. Even if you're not a Penn State fan, I promise you it's the best atmosphere you've ever seen. Uh, and then in February, um, coming into to Vegas, this is what I think the Eagles will be seeing as they come into um, – a nice stable approach to play the bills. That's a picture I took um, when I was coming into Vegas for NMHC. So uh, I do see two soft landings. Unfortunately, they're mostly just for my benefit. It won't be for the benefit of the broader economy. Um, and with that, I think we've gotten through the entire thing <laughs> with two minutes to spare. So Sarah, if you have any questions that, um, that people have thrown over to you, happy to answer those um, with whatever remaining time we have. Sure. Um, well, the first one is, will the Fed change their 2% target? Um, not anytime soon. The, the Fed's most important tool is credibility, and they can't change the target in the middle of the fight. I could see an argument be made um, if we clearly win the war on inflation at some point on the other side of it, starting to dip our toes in that water, they will not do that anytime soon. And I feel very certain about that. And same vein, uh, will the Fed cut back to 0%? Um, barring a shock, a dramatic shock of some kind, probably not. Um, I think that we're probably going to get back into sort of that two to three range is the most likely outcome with some potential of going to zero if we experience another dramatic shock. If the banking system ends up being uh, much more fragile, which I don't believe. I don't believe it's fragile enough to, to require rates at zero. But if something were to happen, then – 0% on the table. I think two and a half, three is probably the baseline going forward. 
All right, and last one uh, that we have time for. Thanks everybody for your questions, by the way. Um, any thoughts on the outlook or trend line for the 10 year? Um, yeah, I'm nervous that it's gonna go higher from here, even though it probably shouldn't. Uh, we're just waiting for the bad data to catch up. We're waiting for 5% interest rates and 2% real rates to work their way through the system. Um, things are going to slow down dramatically over the next 12 months. And so I think that this run up in the 10 year treasury is an aberration. Um, but there was a there was a saying on the trading floor, uh, the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. So um, I would definitely have concerns about near term surges over the long term. I still think the 10 years headed dramatically lower from here. All right. Well, that's all we got, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, remember, we'll be sending out these slides um, via email and uh, we'll see you in Q4. And again, we'll see you on the weekly podcast, The Rate Guy, and also subscribe to our newsletter, Pens Pensford newsletter, if you haven't already. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank you, guys.